Um, before I begin, I would love to uh, thank Dr. Havens, Dr. Ortiz Baco, uh, Dr. Elias in absentia, um, Katie Hodges Clark, of course, and then everybody at the Denbo Center and in the Digital Humanities Program here for their energetic support of DH at UTK. Um, and for the opportunity to be here today and share my work with you. Uh, the Digital Humanities form a crucial part of my approach to scholarly research, teaching, and outreach. As an emerging interdisciplinary field, DH allows us to leverage digital tools and methodologies to pose new questions and to extend the possibilities of existing research. Um, as a brief aside, as you know, a medievalist in DH, I heard uh, pretty early on in my forays that um, medievalists um, have a particular love, at least some of us, for DH because um, we study a point when technologies were changing to when the manuscript became a print book. And um, as many people in the audience will know, early print books looked very much like manuscripts. They were reproducing old things and new technologies and they're gorgeous. But it's also, as technologies change, we have to learn not just how to do the old thing better, but how to think outside the box and do new things. And so I think that's particularly prescient for thinking about what the digital can do for us in transforming our thinking. Um, obviously, DH approaches also seek, as Dr. Evans mentioned, to engage with new audiences bringing together the academic and the public spheres and increasing the accessibility of knowledge. My portfolio includes both individual and collaborative digital projects intended for a variety of audiences, some public, some scholarly, some in blend of both. The portfolio is located on my professional website for the sake of time, we won't go through it, but viewers can uh, tab through the projects as they're laid out here. <clears throat> um, each of these tabs, as you can see, has a description, um, as well as a link to the project, and the description for each of them covers the project's goals, my process in designing and creating some of the more technical aspects, although in brief, um, as well as the benefits, both um, my own learning experience and what I have gained, since this is a portfolio, but also how the project or how the tool or the platform can be useful for scholars, educators, and the intended audience, you know, that, that, and audience. My presentation today will focus on uh, three solo projects. I also have several collaborative things that, of course, if you're curious, you'll have to check out. Okay. Um, the first project today is called Performing Old English Charms. This was my first foray into uh, digital manuscript annotation. Annotation, excuse me. The project explores the genre of medieval medical texts known as charms, specifically examining how these texts blend religious and folkloric beliefs to affect a medical remedy. Um, this project focuses on charms written in Old English drawn from one manuscript called the Lachmunga, which belongs to a category of medical texts known as leech books. So the book is a leech book. Oops, let's not do that. Uh, and then it contains charms. So if we scroll down a little bit, you can see it's split into various sections. I'm going to excerpt just a few things to show you today. Okay. <clears throat> so using an image-based ArcGIS story maps layout, no, no, we want an image-based one. The project offers a critical argument with support from visual and textual evidence in the form of manuscript annotations and image slideshows. Since my argument relies on methodologies um, from manuscript studies and performance studies, having these high resolution manuscript images available at key moments allows me to highlight particular features of the manuscript as a text and as a physical object uh, that support my reading. And so it goes through, depending on the length of the charm, it will be chopped into a variety of pieces with some commentaries, um, both on content and textual features. <clears throat> Compared to my other digital projects, this one remains the closest to traditional scholarship. It's intended for academic audiences. However, the digital format enables more careful and immediate attention to visual evidence, which is difficult to replicate in traditional publishing. Though the image-based layout used in this project is not a sophisticated annotation method, the image slideshows still allow me to zoom in on certain discrete features of a close reading. And uh, the project also displayed a bit more of a scaffolded visual structure. So there are some different section headings and dividers. You can lay out images in ways that are not limited to those slideshows. There are a few different ways. Um, and then just the normal sort of visual publication, uh, digital publication things like having offset quotes. Um, and then you can see here another embedded uh, example. 
Whereas the previous project um, presents a simpler form of manuscript and image commentary, this project um, on the digital mapper platform takes manuscript annotation to the next level. Uh, this project is called the Textual Prayer Project, and it annotates an image that you can see here from the Vernon Manuscript, which is a massive late 14th century compendium of Middle English religious and devotional texts. Um, found in this manuscript is this unique tabular diagram. Let me zoom in a little bit. It's gorgeous. And we can see it without all of my markers if we choose. There we go. Um, uh, and this breaks down the Paternoster or Our Father prayer. It is in both Latin and Middle English, and it also discusses several other aspects that it wants to link the lines of the prayer to, including the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, the seven virtues, and the seven vices. So the project utilizes visual annotations that you just saw um, on the manuscript page in conjunction with the textual resources to allow viewers a deeper dive into the diagram's components and the way those components work together. So as an example, the Latin lines of the prayer go horizontally and they're all in orange, and the corresponding Middle English lines of the prayer are in this white um, teal color. So for each of these, you can either click, let me click this for a sec, for viewing purposes. You can click to see exactly what just this line says by itself in both Latin and uh, modern English or in Middle English and modern English. But if you want to see this in context and not divorced from the rest of the diagram's contents, you can also click, and I'll close this, to see where it's located. So this, as you can see, is labeled line one. So that is the same transcription and translation we saw in the previous one, but it's contextualized back with the rest of the text. And so there's a document that has all of the Latin text. Similarly, there's one that has all of the Middle English as well. And that way you can also link across um, both of these annotations, um, as well as um, across textual documents here in the layout. On the technical front, very briefly, this um, workspace uses triple F images, uh, the International Image Interoperability Framework. And this image, as you can see from the title of it, is from the Bodleian. Um, and once it was loaded in and I added all of my annotations, making all of the links on the back end was a time consuming process that I think very rich and rewarding for a viewer experience. And again, I think that it also, in addition to helping build a useful end um, user audience oriented thing, it also helps you as the researcher to make connections between what you're doing as well. And since this platform has one of the more advanced user interfaces among those in my portfolio, um, the work that I did here in sort of translating what I might do in a traditional format into digital was less about trying to take specialist information and translate it for a non-specialist audience. I was actually speaking still to a specialist audience and translating from the traditional way of accessing that information into um, a not always intuitive. This is one of the more in-depth ones. So um, uh, upon recommendations and an excellent one, I not only have introductory materials here, that you might expect about any project, but also a readme that helps people um, navigate the different uh, digital elements uh, of the project if they're unfamiliar with digital mapa. Because frankly, it's wonderful, but not always intuitive. Right. Uh, the third and final project I'm going to talk about today, hopefully, I'll save the most interesting for last, uh, is mapping the Anglo Saxon Chronicle. This one is an ArcGIS story maps project that does rely on mapping, and it tracks locations from the aforementioned Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in the late fifth and early sixth centuries, following the story of Cerdic and Kimric and the founding of the Kingdom of Wessex. The project aims to present this text for wider public audience um, and to engage them by offering a tour through time and space. Scroll down. <clears throat> So to achieve this goal, the project utilizes two main mapping techniques. The first is this historical map overlay, which was sort of the first step. And as you can see, we can just use it to toggle on and off or to zoom in and out. To create this feature, I used ArcGIS Pro to geo-reference a high-resolution historical map image onto that underlying GIS map layer. And once I have this in place, there we go. 
Um, I created the second technique, which is the guided tour that leads uh, you chronologically through a series of location points. And I use dates from the chronicle, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to um, organize a consecutive series of location points on the map following the character and camera. This is a small snippet of the chronicle, which is a huge document. Each point is accompanied, as you can see, by images. Um, is accompanied by images of the location today and a caption that describes historical happenings at the site. Um, and sometimes modern tidbits as well. This one talks about the etymology of Kerdika Soda. This is the name in Old English. So I'll just keep scrolling more time. Uh, this project was my introduction to storytelling through mapping, and it was my first exposure to ArcGIS. Some of the features are relatively intuitive, especially those within the story maps layout, um, and some require a much deeper dive to sort of figure them out. In addition to gaining this technical expertise, this project prompted me to write, in this case, for a very broad audience. Reimagining my research and tailoring it to new audiences encouraged me to prioritize how I approach my work. For a public audience, the punchline, the relevance, the key takeaways must be articulated clearly and immediately, and crafting an innovative argument becomes less important. As a solo project, mapping the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle showcases only a small piece and is by no means comprehensive. But even a small piece still gives us a glimpse. No, <laughs> no one told me. Um, it still gives us a small glimpse of its ideologies the logic of its creation, and the importance of time and place to its construction of national identity. Although scholars commonly contend with these nuances, texts like the Chronicle are not easily accessible or digestible for wider public audiences. But while the Chronicle may not be a familiar um, name to most folks, no one is unfamiliar with modern white supremacist notions of a pure Anglo-Saxon white past, right? Uh, these false histories have their roots in misuses and misappropriations of many traditions, including medieval history, like that which is reported in the Chronicle. Thus, projects like this one seek to offer a different portrait and a more direct look into history. This project links past and present through shared place, modeling one small way for medieval studies to push back against harmful misuses of historical narratives. So in conclusion, uh, the projects in this portfolio pursue diverse goals and address a variety of audiences, but they all share the fundamental tenet that the digital humanities allow us and even require us to develop new ways of looking at the world and new ways of inviting multiple voices and forms of knowledge making into productive dialogue. Okay.